What about glycolysis? So when we have low amounts of ATP, we want to produce ATP. And so these are the enzyme, these are the allosteric effectors shown in blue that activate the process of glycolysis under low energy conditions. So in this particular case, if we have lots of AMP, the same AMP that inactivates this actually activates the phosphofructokinase. On top of that, the same fructose 2,6-bisphosphate that inactivates this actually activates this. So this molecule is activated by these two allosteric effectors. And pyruvate kinase is activated by the buildup of fructose 6-bisphosphate. Now, why does that actually make sense? Well, if these two molecules activate the activity of phosphofructokinase, we're going to basically create many more fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And as this molecule builds up in the concentration, it will depend on pyruvate kinase to transform these ultimately into pyruvate. And so to basically make sure we don't have a continual buildup of the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, it creates a positive feedback loop and the F1,6-bisphosphate molecule actually activates that pyruvate kinase and that activates the process of glycolysis. So let's summarize our results. So when the cell has a low level of ATP relative to... <coughs> Relative to AMP, that means it basically has a low energy charge and it has a relative, relatively high amount of AMP. And so what that means is we want to produce more of the ATP and we want to use less of the ATP. So gluconeogenesis is shut down, but glycolysis is activated. And so we see that on the glycolytic pathway, we have phosphofructokinase being activated by AMP and F2,6BP, while pyruvate kinase is activated by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. On the other hand, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is inactivated by these two molecules, AMP and F2,6BP. The PEP carboxylase and the pyruvate carboxylase are both inactivated by ADP. And so we conclude that when ATP is plentiful in a cell, the gluconeogenic process, gluconeogenesis predominates. While when ATP is scarce, glycolysis is the process that predominates. Now, one more thing I want to mention before we discuss how glucose affects these two processes in the next lecture is the following. Sometimes you'll hear that Le Chatelier's principle basically dictates which one of these processes will actually take place. And that's not exactly right. We cannot use Le Chatelier's principle to explain why either this process takes place or the other process takes place. Why? Well, because Le Chatelier's principle is used strictly for those reactions which are at equilibrium. And if a reaction is at equilibrium, that means the Gibbs free energy in that process is zero. But we know in gluconeogenesis and in glycolysis, these two processes both release a Gibbs free, uh, release Gibbs free energy. And that means neither of these processes are actually at equilibrium. And so we cannot use Le Chatelier's principle to explain why this process takes place and the other one doesn't actually take place.